Ja ću se sada prebaciti na engleski kako bih pozvao naše prve goste koji će nam govoriti o utopiji Evropske unije. I'll now switch to English and I'll invite to the podium our first guest, Susan George, please come, Janis Varoufakis and Franco Berardi Bifo. Great. So, the utopia of European Union. Maybe you saw these days, uh, parallelly with Subversive Festival, there was a big tent, big blue tent, um, um, uh, that had inscriptions say, I, the citizen of European Union. It was there to promote European Union, and what does it mean to be a citizen? Uh, there was also a little fair uh, where every country or every member state or, or some member states uh, wanted to promote themselves to Croatian citizens, these future European citizens. Of course, there was this whole idea, if we put the context aside, that was promoting this utopia of European Union. Free movements, nobody said to people that they won't be really able to move and go and search for a work because certain sanctions will be imposed. Um, nobody was telling about the current crisis. Everything looked quite nice and joyful. And even to the point that it's so easy to score, I mean, it's, it's easy to score easy points here and be ironic. But we are not going to do this here. We'll try to be much more serious and and not uh, be just ironic, but try to understand what is going on, try to discuss the major risks of the situation in which the European Union is now and the continent of Europe, but we'll also try to suggest some solutions. We are not going to leave this place just analyzing uh, constantly the, same, the, the situation without actually proposing certain solutions. I'm happy here to have with us Susan George. Uh, her career, her life is one big extensive public engagement scholar, activist, the director of Transnational Institute. No, Board president. Yanis uh, Varoufakis, economist, currently teaching at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, lived a very nomadic life that took him from native Greece via Australia, UK, and now the US. And Franco Berardi Bifo, writer, theorist, publicist, activist, founder of Radio Alice, member of Opera Iste, an autonomy movement. I'll start now. We decided to, you know, as good Marxists, we start first with economy with the basis, and then we'll move to superstructure with Susan and Franco. So my first, fact, uh, first question will go to Yanis. So what's wrong in this whole, whole picture that, that, that I described that was just happening outside? What's, what went wrong with this whole idea, utopia of European Union, that was really motivating so many minds in the 80s and 90s? And something went wrong. And now you have this little country, peripheral country, entering this union. Um, were things wrong from the very beginning? Or when they went wrong, in your opinion? The European Union is experiencing, over the last five, six years, a legitimation crisis. In Habermas terms, very, to put simply, it, is, it has created and it is producing and generating, as we speak, expectations that it cannot fulfill. After the Second World War, that was the situation with the nation state. The nation state in Europe, not in the United States of America, could not fulfill 
its promises and the great expectations, in Dickensian terms, great expectations, that it was creating. And the European Union was, at least at the level of the imaginary, the realm in which these unfulfilled expectations were projected. For decades, my country, um, we were going through an awful fascist dictatorship and we always looked to the European Union, to the EEC at the time, as a place where we could find solace and possibly, you know, a friendly port in a terrible storm. And I'm sure that here in Croatia you have experienced the same feelings. But I'm afraid, and that's how I'll finish this, at least in this round, my statement, the European Union was always based on a number of myths. One of them was that it was a European construction. It was never such a thing. It was always an American design, part of what I call the global plan that was put together between 1944 and 1950. Uh, it was an American architectural plan that the elites in Europe and the peoples of Europe embraced for their own different reasons, making their, their own. But unfortunately, after 2008, the world changed and the energy and dynamism that the United States of America was lending to the European Union process, which was essential for keeping that European Union, the way that it was constructed, going, that energy and dynamism shriveled and died with the collapse of Wall Street and has not been revived, and I don't think it can be revived. So now what we're experiencing in Europe is the aftermath of the end of an era which was creating the material conditions for the reproduction of the European Union and for the continued su continuing success of the, of the European Union to inspire the imagination of its people and to make them still feel that their great expectations could be fulfilled at the realm of the European Union. Susan, in 2005, in French, you published We the Peoples of Europe. The, the English translation came out in 2008. It was, the book was dedicated to constitutional attempts to what you described, basically, by attempts by the European elites to institutionalize neoliberal and anti-democratic Europe. You called then, back then, uh, the peoples of Europe to resist this. Um, are you today less optimistic that the resistance is possible? Well, I wouldn't start with today. Let me start with 2005, because that was the most exciting debate that we had had in France since May 68, basically. This was an enormous debate. There were a thousand local commissions set up all over the country, uh, which made real coalitions with trade unionists, with ordinary citizens, with social movement people, with educators, health workers. It's, it was fantastic. And Although this constitution we were voting on was the most boring document you can imagine and the most difficult to get through, you know, it was always referring to another article, you had to read it in all sorts of cross ways, um, it created a huge debate and it was a bestseller. It was at the top of the bestseller lists for weeks in France. And brothers and sisters and lovers and all kinds of people, one was on the yes side, the other was on the no. I mean, there were real fights about this. So it was a fantastic debate. And it went to the bottom of the, of the European problems. We really did. Militarism, uh, lack of social policy, uh, the way the economy was set up, the whole uh, push towards neoliberalism, the four freedoms, what were the objectives of the of the EU, well, competitivity cannot be an objective in my view. I mean, you might say the pursuit of happiness, as uh, the Declaration of Independence says, but you can't say competitivity is an objective, I don't think. Anyway, we won. That was what was fantastic. The left won. Many people outside France think it was a right-wing vote. It wasn't. There was about 15% of the no vote was right-wing, but it was a class vote. I can give you an example. Uh, in the town of Neuilly, of which Nicolas Sarkozy was mayor, and you don't get more right-wing than that, 85% voted yes. And in a, a working-class uh, suburb of, of Rouen, 85% uh, voted no. So it really was a class vote. And uh, when we won, 
and then the Dutch won two days later. And we didn't win the way you do usually French elections, 49 point something to 50 point something. It was, it was 55 percent. And then the Dutch vote 61 percent for no. So we thought, wow, you know, and we've, we've really shown them, you know, because the entire establishment was, of course, for the yes. And of course, what happens after that, naturally, is what I love is the expression of Gunther Verheugen. He was the vice president of the commission and the commissioner for the internal market, I think. And he said, we must not give in to blackmail. So much for popular sovereignty, right? Blackmail. Then what do they do? They have to follow their own rules to some degree, which was it's got to be unanimous. And of course it wasn't, and it couldn't be. So they immediately have a sort of shadowy committee that rewrites the Lisbon Treaty. And that's what we're living under now. But it is a carbon copy of the, the Constitution which we defeated. And don't believe me, believe Giscard d'Estaing, who said they have made, I'm quoting, made cosmetic changes to make it easier to swallow. So that's what we're living under now. And I think there has been a continual assault against democracy since, I mean, it became totally visible in 2005, but it, was, it didn't begin there, and it certainly hasn't ended there. And what perhaps all Croatians do not know is that once you join the European Union, 85, about 80, 85% of your legislation is not going to come from the Croatian parliament and the Croatian government with people you have elected. It is going to come from Brussels. And I, I think that that's something one has really to take into account. Uh, and now we are in, of course, a totally neoliberal neo period with new treaties that have been added one after the other. Even I can't keep up with them, although I'm supposed to be spending my life doing this sort of work. And the major... Um, questions that ought to be submitted to a parliament, such as the national budget, how much do we spend on health, how much do we spend on education, how much do we spend on the military, etc., is not going to be decided uh, primarily by the Croatians. It goes to Brussels first, and then, I mean, I could say a lot more, but I, uh, that's as short as I could make it, uh, Igor. So I would say that from, from what you were saying, and I remember that period 2005, I was in France then, and there was an excitement, a really uh, fantastic debates from Paris to little cities about what this European future means, and the no was not no to Europe no. as such. No was no to this type of Europe. Uh, to this Europe, yes. yes. And one could say that, you know, as we are progressing uh, from 2005, the things are getting even worse. So yes, there was a moment of popular will, and then that moment was sidelined. Uh, Franco, in your book, The Uprising, uh, that you, that that came out by Semiotext recently. You are speaking about 2011 as the first year of the uprising, but you are also speaking about the collapse of Europe, about the collapse of the utopia of the EU. You are seeing this as a complete dead end where the very imagination of European future is lacking. So today we just had a brief discussion before and you seemed even more pessimistic. It's okay. <clears throat> well, um, that book I wrote in 2011, right? And um, 2011 has been a, a wonderful e year by many points of view. Remember the, the success and the, 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 the story uh, December 2010, uh, London, uh, 100,000 people in the streets, uh, students uh, against uh, the, the destruction of the public school, uh, the cuts, uh, and the same thing happening in Rome, December 14, 2010. Then, beginning 2011, 
Remember what happens in Cairo, in Tunis, uh, in a large part of the Arab world, in a strong, in a, in a, in a narrow relation with uh, what is happening in the, the European cities. Uh, it's the same people, precarious workers, unemployed, cognitive workers, uh, internet users, uh, people who uh, try to live in the, in the, in the uh, new world of technologies in a human and democratic way. Then, the Spanish Acampada. For one month, six million people occupy the squares of 60 cities in Spain. Then, the four nights of rage in, in London, again, in August, then Occupy Wall Street. This is 2011. And I, I, I told myself, this is the beginning of, a, of, a, of an uprising. An uprising of the, of the cognitive precarious workers who start creating the possibility for a new conception of democracy. And, uh, well, I was wrong. I was wrong. And uh, I think that I was wrong because probably something uh, has happened in, in a very deep space of the social composition, and pre probably precarity is, a, a, is the impossibility of a process of self-organization, of recomposition, and of the, uh, democracy, uh, in a sense. Um, what has happened in the Arab world, what has happened in London in the last two years, the big wave of depression, of psychic depression, the wave of suicide which is mounting everywhere in, where in, the, in the world, makes me think that we have to be more radical in our, in, our, in, our, in our understanding of what is happening. We are not talking about politics, we are not talking about democracy, we are talking about the very constitution of the, of the human soul, of the human uh, unconscious, of the ability of creating society. This is collapsing nowadays, the possibility of solidarity. And solidarity is not a political value. It's not an ideological value. Solidarity means empathy, means the ability to, to, to perceive the body of the other as part of your own body. This has collapsed. And this is our problem now. Yanis, uh, precisely Franco is bringing us to the point that you also raised, um, depression, so austerity, and that and, uh, creates depression, but not only economic depression, individual depression. So you've been severe critic of austerity and especially of collective punishment of countries such as Greece or Cyprus. Um, do you think, although some of your you know, echoes of your criticism now resonates even at the top of the European Union, you know, Barroso recently said, oh, this might not be working. But apparently, politically, it works. I mean, people are even more depressed. So do you think that they're going to give up or they're going simply to use austerity as a quite convenient form of governance? There's no doubt they're trying to. But before I answer this specific question, let me connect it to something that both Susan and Franco said. Franco, the reason why the 2011 mass movement died was because the tailspin of the social economy, of the economy, of capitalism, uh, accelerated. And as we all know, especially from the 1930s, a period of uh, negative engineering, a period of a rapid descent into the abyss of depression is not a revolutionary period. There may be some movements that form initially, but as, until and unless stabilization is reached, they are dispersed by the pain of hopelessness. And people simply privatize their fears and stay at home and lick their wounds when they can't put food on the table. It's only when capitalism stabilizes, one way or the other, that mass protest movements begin again. Uh, and uh, Susan, 
you know better than anyone in this hall that uh, the European Union was created purposely as a democracy-free zone. So what we had in 2005, what we're having now, yeah, we have a, a European Commission and a Commissioner for Economic Affairs who dared say in the year 2013, Oli Ren I'm referring to, in response to the International Monetary Fund's admission of major errors in computing the effects of austerity on social economies, that this was an, an unhelpful statement by the IMF because it created doubt in the mind of European people about the course that we are taking. Now, you don't, you don't need to add anything to this as commentary, do you? As far as the question about debt and austerity and the crisis. Let's get thing one, one thing absolutely straight here. This is not a debt crisis. Greece doesn't have a debt crisis. Croatia doesn't have a de debt crisis. The United States doesn't have a de debt crisis. Europe doesn't have a debt crisis. Saying that we have a debt crisis is like me going to the doctor. Let's say that, knock on wood, I have a terrible case of cancer and I'm in great pain, and having the diagnosis given to me that I'm suffering a pain crisis. It's true, but it is irrelevant and analytically completely useless. Debt is a symptom. What we had in 2008 was the implosion of the financial sector of global capitalism, which then, just like in 1929, spread out into the real economy and created a depression, and debt was a symptom. But there was another symptom at the same time, just like in 29, now. A mountain of money with nowhere to go. We have two mountains in the global economy and in Europe. We have a mountain of debt and banking losses, and we have an equally sized mountain of savings, idle savings, with nowhere to go. And this is simply a sign of a breakdown in capitalism's capacity to reproduce itself and to use the surpluses as investments to produce the incomes that will pay back the debts. This is, we have a breakdown of the recycling mechanism within the capitalist social economy. The exclusive focus on debt is part of the class struggle that is um, promoted not by the left, but by finance and banking in particular, in the context of what I've, I call a new regime that has emerged after 2008, bankruptocracy, ruled by bankrupt banks, for the purposes of transferring losses from their books onto the taxpayers. This is why we have all this emphasis on debt, which is a short, um, a shortcut towards a policy of reducing social security payments, reducing health and education expenses, in order to make room for greater assistance, assistance to the bank, to the bankrupt banks, um, they will continue pursuing this strategy as long as, as there is no. Uh, organized, synchronized, orchestrated response by us against them. Except one thing, they can't go against the logic of capital accumulation, they can't go against the logic of their own construct. And austerity, as Keynes very astutely told us in 1936, in his general theory, capitalism, once it's caught up in this tailspin, it's simply unsustainable when austerity is the only tool that they have. Susan, you definitely worked on that like for almost the last 30 years. Uh, just to mention your, your books, A Fate Worse Than Debt in 88, published in 88. In early 90s, you published The Debt Boomerang, 92. Fate and Credit in 94. The whole, we've been bombarded with the that discourse uh, over the last five years. But during that period when you published your books, for next, some 15 years, there was, you know, nobody was speaking about that uh, 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 very much. Even, again, referring to the debate in France, um, people were analyzing articles and so on, but not getting deeper into the, 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 this problem. So w w was it 
did we all suc succumb to, to what you call the world's bank secular empire where, you know, credit and fate are intermingled and we all believe that there is a, some salvation at the end of the tunnel? And how, after, after all, we recreated this discourse of that? Was it really recreated by economists who knew all the time what was happening? Did you know all the time what was coming? I can't say I, all, I knew all the time what was coming, but I certainly can recognize the patterns which are exactly the same. It's our turn in Europe now, but it was the turn of the South earlier. Uh, the loans were pushed upon them very often. They were in borrowing at the beginning at negative interest rates, so actually they were being paid to borrow because uh, the interest rates were lower than, than inflation, so fine, why not? Uh, and they borrowed for a lot of wrong reasons, militarism, uh, buying weapons, uh, white elephant projects, the cathedrals in the desert, um, a lot of goodies for the upper and middle classes. Uh, maybe 20% was invested productively, but I don't think more than 20%. And. Uh, naturally, at one point, when the interest rates in the United States went up really to the sky, uh, suddenly they were having to pay 8, 9, 10 percent, who knows how much. And they could not sustain that. And so, of course, there was a crisis in Mexico, and then this crisis in 82, and then this crisis spread through the, uh, through the entire um, the South, Africa, Latin America, and Asia. And again, the IMF and the World Bank were, were there, and they had the same program, which was called at the time the Washington Consensus. Uh, Matt, no, now, now it's called um, austerity, but it's exactly the same programs. And it, they didn't work then, and of course they don't work now, as Yanis has, has already said. But what do we mean by working? That, that is the question, I think. And, and there are really two ways to look at this. Uh, if working means that the people actually can find a job, have a dignified life, have a place to live, um, be able to educate their children, etc., uh, these policies are an abject failure, that is clear. But uh, the view of, for instance, Paul Krugman and Joseph Stiglitz, both Nobel Prize economists, parenthesis, the Nobel Prize in economics does not exist, but I don't have time to explain why not. Um, but they say, uh, these European leaders don't understand economics, uh, they are completely ignorant, uh, we have to show them that they can get out of this trap, uh, and they consider it a problem of, eco of economic ignorance and stupidity. Or, that's one way to look at it, there's another way to look at it, which is to say the European leadership is just as intelligent as anyone else's leadership, which maybe means not terribly intelligent, but still, they, I think they know what they're doing, and I think they're doing it with intent, and what has happened is very clearly that the, the problem, which was entirely created by the financial sector, where 80% of everything in the economy was going, it wasn't going into the real economy of actual production of goods and services. No, it was going to financial products, which were more and more exotic. And so when this bubble crashes, when it bursts, uh, the banks are not interested in taking a hit, the elites are not interested in taking a hit, and therefore, who is going to pay? The citizen, of course. Uh, it's very clear. Um, and so it works in that sense, because what happens during the crisis, why did states get indebted? I did a, I did a tableau of this. You can look at the statistics. What was the national debt in 2006, before the crisis burst? What was it in 2010? You've got every single country going up at a different rate, but Spain had, did not have a particularly important national debt. It had 38% uh, of GDP. That's nothing, you know. I mean, people think a, a, a country debt is the same as a family debt. It's not. It, it, it's absolutely not the same thing. It is normal for a state to be indebted. The United States has been indebted since 
permanently since 1830 something. So it's perfectly normal if the money is invested uh, productively. However, the, 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 um, the way it was invested in this case is, was to bail out the banks. That cost a lot. Throughout Europe, the GDP on average fell by about 5%. States had to compensate for that. Meanwhile, small and medium enterprise was failing in droves, massive failures, people unemployed suddenly, people who required unemployment compensation, so that's more expenditures. On this other side, there are much lower taxes being paid because more people are unemployed, so you've got a problem of the money that is going out, which was not foreseen. And the debt in Ireland, for, in, for instance, which is the worst, increases over four years by 200, 275%. I mean, because they took on all the private debts of all the private banks. So, what do you do in that case? Well, you say, well, it's the citizens who are responsible uh, because you have been living beyond your means. That is the big mantra. You haven't been living beyond your means. That is rubbish but that they repeat it often enough and people believe this. They think, well, yes, if I, a family, you know, can't really get that indebted, so neither can a country and da da, da. But the, these, this is just ideology, it's only propaganda. So we're paying twice. We paid already to bail out the banks and now we pay through austerity, which is the same thing as structural adjustment in the, in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, and, uh, and it goes on like that. It's, uh, and I don't see how we can get out of this because it, this is, the, it is the, the policy, I think, of the European Union to allow this to happen. And I simply, all I can say is that it is not just a financial crisis, it's a moral crisis because we punish the innocent and we reward the guilty. The bankers haven't paid anything. So, Good for them, hooray, but you know, it's not exactly the outcome I was hoping for for Europe. Now we are coming to, uh, again to, to the concept that you launched recently, uh, and I wonder whether you revised this as well. You said in, in the uprising, you said that a new concept is emerging from the fog of the present situation that has been so accurately described by Susan and Yanis, the right to insolvency. We are not going to pay the debt simply, the right to insolvency. Now, before you just, you said that basically um, there have been, you know, a war against um, human, human soul or capacities or, 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 or intellectual uh, uh, abilities. Now, how do you see this right to insolvency to get out of this, this situation? Uh, um, uh, um, how this right to insolvency could help to, to constitute a new subject? Well, <clears throat> um, I, I, w I want to, to quote uh, the book of a friend who will be, will be in Zagreb uh, in the next days, Maurizio Lazzarato, probably is here somewhere. Um, Maurizio Lazzarato uh, has published a book uh, about debt, explaining that debt is not only, um, I would also say, not especially an economic uh, problem. Debt is essentially the creation of a, um, of a form of social, cultural, psychological um, dependency on a sort of uh, uh, entity which is, uh, uh, which is the bank, the financial system, uh, the governance, uh, and so on. I would say that the, also I want to remember another, another book and another person, David Graeber, uh, who wrote a, a huge book uh, on debt that uh, um, I, I don't want to summarize the book, but just I want to say, um, I wanted to... Uh, published in Croatian soon, 
Uh, yes, so so you'll yeah. get to read the book, but you can get to the yeah. Uh, D D David Greiber is not an economist; uh, he's an anthropologist, and um, that is good because uh, if you ask the economist about the debt, uh, they they don't tell you the, the the crucial thing: what is a debt? And David answer: a debt is an act of language; it's essentially an act of language. I ask you something, you give me something, I promise, tomorrow I will give you back. Then I come tomorrow and I tell you, oh, pardon me, I don't have the money you, you gave me yesterday. What do you want to do? Do you want to kill me? Or we start negotiating a new act of language. So the problem is that debt has been creating a sort of network of double binds, of, of uh, uh, entanglements, of, uh, um, well, of uh, blackmails that are creating a situation which is not only or essentially a, a, situa a situation of economic crisis, but is essentially a situation of depression, of lack of imagination about the, about the future. So, uh, so, insolvency. What insolvency means? Insolvency means I don't have money, so I don't pay the debt. But it's not only an economic debt we are talking about. So it's not only an economic insolvency we are talking about. I think that the concept of insolvency is interesting because it's about the deep um, uh, dependency on capital, on, on power. Um, I refuse to pay the moral debt. I refuse to pay the blackmail that you are using to force me to be exploited, to accept everything, and so on and so on. You know, I think that the problem of um, debt, insolvency, moral debt, and so on, is very important in Europe, because I don't know so much about the uh, political and economic intentions of the founding fathers of Europe. I know that uh, Europe, the real root of Europe, can be found in the 16th century, when a German uh, monk called Martin Luther started to talking about debt in another way in relation to the, to the Catholic way. I mean, the, the real uh, distinction, break, difference, the real cultural problem which uh, is at the, at the bottom of the European situation is the relation between pro Gothic Protestants and Baroque Catholics. It's essentially a cultural problem. It's a problem of relation with time, of relation with future, of relation with the value of word, uh, of, of, of the act of language. It's about the relation between language and God and what. So, can we think that this problem can be uh, only faced in terms of banks, finance, uh, and uh, economic governance? I don't think so. I think that we have to open a huge uh, uh, discussion, which is a discussion about what is language, how can we get free how can we be insolvent at the linguistic level, at the moral level, and at the economic level too? Mm -hmm. So now, yes, yes, I'll, exactly, I'll ask you this thing. This is what I mentioned by, you know, basis and superstructure. Pardon me, I, I say the Protestants and Catholics. I forgot the Orthodox, of course, you can guess. So, how this sounds to you? Now back to, 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 to the basis, right to insolvency. How would well, you operationalize it? Okay, a few comments on this, because this is crucial, I think, and Frank is absolutely spot on. Look, how did capitalism become dynamic? It's not because of the steam engine so much. 
It's because of limited liability. Sometime in the middle of the 19th century, they came up with an amazing idea that entrepreneurs who lost their shirt, whose company went bust, at some point would no longer be liable personally for the losses of their firm. The, what's this? It's the, the right to insolvency without being taken to the cleaners personally, without losing your home, without having your children living in the slums, right? So the capitalists looked after their own right to insolvency. But what was absolutely not allowed was the right to insolvency of states, especially weak states, especially states that were weak and not under the umbrella of some imperialist. So when Saddam Hussein was ousted, Iraq was allowed by the invading uh, coalition of the willing to default completely on its debts without a second question. But Greece was not allowed. So it, it's, it's, there are triple and quadruple standards here. Now, Franco, regarding the language of debt, I believe that in most Latin-based languages in Europe, um, debt is associated with the word credit, which has to do with belief, except in Germany, where debt is associated with the word guilt. And I think you're quite right that, you know, language is a good Ugovor o radu. 
i za distribuciju je bila na drugom mjestu, a zadnje na kraju proizvodnja. E sad, to na neki način je bilo ono što je otvorilo zapravo nastanak velikih produktivnih snaga i kapitalizam je sada imao tu kreativnu i destruktivnu snagu i razlog zašto se povijest tako brzo kretala bilo je upravo zbog tog duga. Dug je omogućio poduzetskom kapitalistu da ide u budućnost, da uzme jednu vrijednost koja još ne postoji iz budućnosti u sadašnjost i da stvori vrijednost koja će se odplatiti u budućnosti. Dug je osnovi funkcionalni instrument kapitalizma kako bi se stvorio zapravo da imate krivnju oko duga, da ste zapravo idiot, ako ste kapitalist. Naravno, problem je u tome što iako je bio uspješan taj proces i te veliki poticaj za bankare e, i za kapitaliste da sama u budućnost, da bi uzeli tu vrijednost i doveli u donijela je u sadršnjost, naravno došlo je do krize realizacije i bilo je nemoguće u nekom trenutku odplatiti budućnost i zato je došlo do krize. I naravno onda sve što se dogodilo poslije toga i zapravo je došlo u tom trenutku do nesolventnosti. Na nesolventnost se u nekom trenutku morala prihvatiti. Nije prihvatila se. I Susan, nema sumnje da študnja zaista ima dugu tradiciju Herbert Hoover u Sjedinovičkim državama nakon 29 godine, je uveo štednju kao izlaz iz velike depresije. To je bilo idiotski čin, kao što je Europa, ali imao velike razlike između Amerike i Europe, posebice u Eurozoni. Za razliku od sjemnjačih država koje su imali depresiju, koje nisu morali imati nakon 1999. godine i ne bi je imali da su bili drugči omjeri snaga, u usporedbi sa 33. godina, međutim u Americi se nikada nisu suočavali sa opasnošću od fragmentacije. Zato što se oni odgovorili na veliku depresiju, na krizu 29. godine, konsolidacijom, okrupnjavanjem, stvaranjem institucija za socijalnu sigurnost, odnosno mehanizam za reciklažu viška, isto tako reciklažu duga, a u Europi veliki lideri su potpuni idioti usporedbi sa svim onim idiotima s druge strane Atlantika i ne mogu vidjeti da na čelo savršeno razdvojenih dugova, dakle svaka nacija država sa svojim dugom i gospodin Šobrna govori da se svi moraju brinuti o svom vlastitom dugu, da to nije nešto što je konsistentno sa projektom Evropske unije. Suzan, fragmentacija. Vidite vi to kao veliki rizik u Evropi. Naravno da postoji veliki rizik od fragmentacije, ali moram reći da ja osjećam da nisam na pravom mjestu, jer recimo dok mogu uživati ono, ona razmišljenja koja i zapravo imaginacije Franka Janisa, ja sam više duboko na zemlji, sa čvrsto na zemlji, vidim da ljudi umiru od štednje, vidim da se to događa oko mene, vidim kako ljudi pate, vidim tu ljudsku patnju. Jedna stvar koju sam naučila možda kada sam radila na dugu, na jugu, kao što sam spomenula prije nekoliko godina, bilo je to da nije bilo bitno koliko su ljudi patili, jer zaista nije došlo do tog stupnja ljudsko, ljudske patnje koju bi ponukalo, ponukalo promjenu politike. politike. Politika se mogla promijeniti samo ovisno o tome što se događalo na sjeveru sa sjevernim vlastima i vjerovnicima. I mislim da je to ista stvar koja se događa i danas i vjerujem da zaista postoje oni koji su krivci. Znam kako su se banke ponašale u sjevernjačkih država, potrošile su 5 milijardi dolara i um, sklonili su sve one propise koje su Franklin i Roosevelt uspostavili i jednostavno su se um, oslobodili zakona koji je spričavao bankama koji su toliko velike koliko jesu jer morate odvojiti komercijalno bankarstvo od onog investicijskog mjesta na koje odlaze vaše plaće nisu ist, nije isto mjesto na kojemu se banke mogu igrati s vašim novcima evo to je bilo sada ukinuto i bankari su nakon što je ukinut taj zakon, ali i mnogi drugi propisi koji su omogućili da Amerika bude sigurna 70 godina. A rođena sam u sjemečkim državama i moji roditelji su prošli kroz vrijeme depresije, velike krize. 
I da je Roosevelt bio na vlasti i da su njegovi zakoni još uvijek na snazi, to se ne bi dogodilo. Evo, to je tako jednostavno. I bankarima je trebalo da od 1999. do 2007. da stvore veliku krizu i ona se još uvijek nije zaustavila, nego još gore. Jer porezne, porezne oaze su sada još uvijek tu, koriste i banke i velike korporacije, isto tako i bogati pojedinci, ima više bogatih pojedinaca danas nego li ih je bilo prije pet godina, prije krize. I oni isto tako imaju veliko bogatstvo, ima negdje oko 11 milijuna vrlo bogatih pojedinaca u svijetu koji imaju to zajedničko bogatstvo od 42 trilijuna dolara, što je tri puta više od BDP-a cijele Europske unije ili SAD-a ima više financijskih proizvoda na tržištu danas nego ih je bilo 2007. godine i tako dalje, tako dalje. Ima svih mogućih dokaza da ti ljudi pobjeđuju. I zato ja kažem da smo i mi tako isto u krizi demokracije. I tu su golemi rizici jer kada društva postanu nejednaka kao što su postala danas, onda rizi, postoje rizik od velikog društvenog sloma. A sada možete vidjeti koji su to izvori matematički možete pročitati chemistry, physics and biology. But you can't fight nature. If you do, you lose. That I think is clear. And then society. What kind of an economy, what kind of a society do we want? What is the economy that can best serve that society? What is the place of finance? It should be a tool, just like a whole lot of other economic tools. I'm sorry to be so pragmatic, but uh, but but I think, you know, we, it's, it's really um, essential to talk about as i said about the suffering about the what what this is doing to people and how much future crisis it's 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 creating also it may be about language and i can accept the part about about debt and so on but uh, but it's not just uh, franco you you're quite concrete in your statements about the fu- the, the, the 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 future that's been prepared you're talking about massive fascist reaction, you are talking about the re-territorialization of Europe, you are basically talking about conflicts, wars and violence along ethnic, religious or imaginary cultural grounds, I mean something we know quite well here. So is it, is, do, would you say that our recent past might be European future? Well. <coughs> I don't want to use the word fascism. I do it because it's the, the easiest way to, 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 to understand, to communicate something in a strong way. But um, we are not going to see uh, again the, the same movie. Um, we are going to see a very bad movie anyway. And the, what is happening in Europe is already deeply marked, not only by fragmentation in a political sense, but by a, 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 a sort of decomposition of social solidarity at every level. This is the, 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 um, the problem. The, um, five years ago, <coughs> Italians who were against the euro were around 20%. Now, 75% of Italian voters have voted against Europe. 
Um, in Spain, 75% of people have declared to be against the euro. In Germany, 57% of people have declared to be... Uh, this is uh, the, the symptom of the catastrophe that the financial class, the European Central Bank, has produced uh, in Europe. And you know, we are not going to change uh, in the next uh, 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 months or in the next years. We are not going to change the scenario because the recession is here and it's going to worsen. And because the, the politics of, uh, of, the, of the leading class in Europe is not uh, open to a possibility of change. You know, I listened to Mr. Mario Draghi, who happens to be the president of the European Central Bank, and a very ironic person. Uh, he, 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 has been, he, he took part in a press conference. Uh, he was speaking at the press conference, of course, and uh, he looked around uh, at the audience, at the journalists, and he said, I see that the uh, journalists are uh, very impressed and excited by what is happening in Italy. I mean, 75% voting against Europe in a way or another, voting for the right wing Berlusconi, for the left wing Grillo, not voting at all, but anyway, 75% of Italians have said no to, to the European uh, Union, to the Euro, and so on. So Draghi says, I see that you are so excited. I am not, because I know that the European politics go on with the automatic pilot. You see, you, you, I, I think it's a very important statement. Um, arrogant, cynical, anti-democratic, as you want, but also very, very deep on a philosophical level. What he is saying is... Democracy is dead, not because I am a dictator, but because the financial rule is a sort of a system of automatisms which make impossible the political uh, choice, that make impossible the human uh, voluntary choice. This is the meaning of the words of Draghi, and this is why I see that uh, the future is very dark by this point of view. So, we said and we agreed that before leaving this room, we'll offer some solutions. We are not going to just leave this room on, on these notes. We could be pessimists, but you, all three of you, have some ideas about possible solutions. But I would now like to open floor to, to the audience. You, you throw a lot of material, and I'm sure there will be, there'll be a lot of questions. So I would now ask you um, to ask our speakers uh, to comment or to criticize or to ask direct questions to them. So, any hands? There's one here. Okay, there's another there. Okay. Could okay, you thank you. If I rob the bank, then, and then claim that the money is mine, would be it okay? Because that's the behavior of most uh, European colonial countries. They plundered all the continents throughout centuries. And then they claim that's our money because we had a good strategy, good army, good government, so we uh, were able to plunder the earth. So what do you want from us? You want your money, your money back? You want your gold back? You want your silver back? You want your oil back? No, no, no. It, it's ours because we have the power to get it from you by force. So, all that is the problem of accountancy. Let's put all values on one uh, uh, accountant. Uh, paper and then see who has a bigger debt. The European countries towards the ex-colonies or 
the so-called developed country against the huge banks. I could have more questions, but I, I stay here because there are other people having other questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll collect questions. There, there was one there. Could you please? Oh, okay, finally. I have actual question for Franco. Uh, regarding his book, uh, which he published in 1992, I think, about uh, Felix uh, Gattari, his friend, and I think that somewhere in the introduction to his book, basically, when he writes about his friend, and he says that uh, revolutionary never considered depression as a revolutionary possibility. And I think, uh, taking into consideration all our discussion here, which basically comes, in my opinion, and focus on the question of the subject, of the production of the subjectivity. And I think that's kind of main point where all, all, all discussions converge to. So my question is, again, depression and revolutionary potential. Thank you. Then the young gentleman here. Thank you. Um, I have heard uh, by the speakers that they think that the movements of 2011 are defeated, and I think this is not completely correct. Uh, maybe they are not as uh, often in the mass media, the corporate media, as before, but I believe that the big wave of movements that happen in several countries is still uh, active and actually creating a new generation of young activists. Um, in the case of Europe, uh, also I think there is a strong uh, um, effort to converge the traditional actors, such as trade unions, with new generation of activists. Also, Susan George has commented something about the Alter Summit. Maybe she can say something more about that. And I also would like to, to raise the, the question that I think that um, thanks to this uh, resistance by the new generation of activists against the Euro neoliberal Europe, in a way we are uh, being more close. So through this resistance against the European project, we are becoming more Europeans. So I would like to know the opinion about that. And there was four questions there, and then we'll hear our speakers. Raise, raise the hand. Thank you. I have uh, very uh, brief two points. Very brief. Uh, the first uh, point that I would like to raise is this: uh, it's a question regarding the concept of Europe that you use. It seems, and that has been used in, uh, in this discussion tonight, it seems that uh, it looks like a block in itself, uh, while losing at the same time the internal differentiation within this uh, construction. So I was wondering if you can uh, elaborate upon within the, uh, about the differentiation within the uh, e, uh, EU and within the concept of Europe uh, uh, at the same time, because I think the two should be uh, differentiated. And the second point, uh, that, which is a little bit more general, that I would uh, um, like to raise in relation to this discussion about uh, EU and uh, the current state uh, of the EU, um, I was wondering what is, in your opinion, because for me it was not very clear, the proper uh, and specific dif uh, difference between uh, the extreme right uh, criticism of the EU and the leftist criticism of the EU. Because at the moment, it's not really clear uh, which, uh, uh, what is the essential difference between uh, the two. So I was wondering if you can uh, touch upon this issue. So, you, what, what's the main difference between the right-wing view of the current situation and the left-wing view, right-wing criticism of this? So, should we, Susan, would you like would you like to start and address some of the points there? Well, I'll try. Um, I'll, I'll try. The, uh, the second was for Franco. Um, yes, Europe, of course, is a, was a colonial power. 
and lost a lot of that in the First and Second World Wars, um, and is uh, guilty of many, many sins. Uh, certainly the entire 19th and 20th century aren't very much to Europe's credit. I couldn't agree more. But uh, Europe has also invented a lot of very valuable things, which I believe are worth preserving in what I would call the Enlightenment model. We've also given a certain number of things uh, to, to humanity, to, to culture, the welfare state, you can say that it was partly based on colonial income. Sure, I agree with you. Uh, but uh, heaven knows many people in Europe have been fighting to get the European Union to be a much bigger donor uh, to the South, to those countries. Many people are talking about our ecological debt to the South. I mean, I think there is a movement in that direction, but right now, and this links to the uh, other question, of the third question, about uh, what are the priorities now? Because uh, although we have many debts towards the South uh, and, the and the formerly colonized countries, there really is no discussion at all about that now. The South has disappeared unless it's the subject of competition with the BRICS, China, Brazil, etc. But the whole question of cooperation, I would say, has been erased from the official agenda. And many people who used to be, con I am guilty of that. I have used to concentrate a lot on North-South relations. And now the, the, the situation is so terrible in Europe that I spend nine-tenths of my time on that. That's the only answer I can give you. You're quite right. Everyone has a debt to everybody else, yes. Uh, but the, the currency we count those debts in, I'm speaking metaphorically, is not the same, is not the same currency. So it's, it's difficult to put, to put that uh, on, on the same. And uh, yes, you're right. And I'm glad to hear this, uh, this coming from a young person because there is a big effort in Europe to converge, and I'm glad that you feel that you're European. Uh, I look at this audience, you're clearly, as far as I can tell, you're all Europeans, you know, but uh, I, I wouldn't be so rash as to say join this Europe, you know, because, uh, because I think I know what you'd be getting in for. So that's up to the Croatians. You've got to have your own debate about that. But one of the solutions is certainly exactly what you say. It is to converge the, the struggles and to um, do a better job of it than we have done so far. That's what we've spent Friday and Saturday trying to do among, uh, uh, there's 140 organizations now uh, in the Altar Summit, uh, trade unions, social movements, uh, ecologists, feminists, uh, researchers, uh, uh, all kinds of people, and I think that that is one avenue towards the future, but this is, I have to be honest, this is really embryonic for the moment, and it is, uh, but I, I think you're right also that because of the crisis, uh, it's easier now to say we are all Spaniards now, or we are all Greeks now, or, uh, so, so that, that, is, that is encouraging. But the power relationships haven't changed at all. And the big fight is that we really have adversaries. We have very tough and very powerful adversaries who all want the same thing and who are all united. And if I can just say one word about the Occupy movement in the United States, um, I think that it was, uh, of course, we, we had a lot of hopes for it. You know, I sent a check and lots of people wanted to be in solidarity with that movement. But let's be honest, that movement was really a lot about process. They never even got to the point of making any demands. They said they had a committee to decide if they could make demands, but nothing ever happened on that score. Even the expulsions, that were the, the turfing people out of their houses and their flats, they, they didn't even have position on that. They didn't even say to the mayor of New York, stop doing that, you know, or we'll occupy, uh, we'll save the people from being expelled. From, and, and it was a lot about uh, 
it was marvelous to all be together and be making, you know, movements of your hands in the air, but I don't think process is as important uh, as substance, and, and that they did not get around to. Let, let's, let's be, we have to be honest about that. Now, the Indignados are something else. I think they are more serious, and they're, they're more European. <laughs> now, Yanis, slowly we are running out of time, but maybe I'll ask Yanis now, and then Franco. Not out of time, but slowly approaching that moment. Okay, uh, property, of course, has its roots in theft, not just of the colonies, but everywhere. The problem is that when you have imperialism, because this is the process that you described, you have a very similar process to what's happening with our encroachments on the environment that Susan mentioned before. What we have is things of substantial use value, value, are appropriated by capitalist forces that only understand about exchange values. So when we, you know, we Europeans went to Africa and plundered, we took things that were of immense value to the people there, but which had no prices attached to them. So it's impossible to actually do an accounting exercise, as you, as you suggested. Um, on the question of the revolutionary potential, I too am very happy that you mentioned it, and that you keep the faith. We are a bit older, and we are disappointed that 2011 fizzled out, even though some of us expected it to. And my personal worry is that as long as this crisis is accelerating, the, the spin is getting worse, uh, the movement is not going to be able to pick up again and to contribute the substance that Susan mentioned. I, I just want to finish off with a statement regarding, a statement, an answer regarding the difference between the extreme right and the left and their criticisms on what's happening in the European Union. It is very murky. I understand that it's, it's ever so, I get confused. Sometimes I hear somebody say something that sounds sensible and then suddenly he says, well, it's the Jews' fault or the, you know, the Nigerians or the Pakistanis, and then I freak out because if you read Goebbels, in the 1920s, you will find that amongst the misanthropy, there are paragraphs of economic brilliance in the critique of the capitalism that he was criticizing at the time. So the, the line is blurry, but it's definite. And let me tell you what I think the difference between a right-wing and a left-wing critique is. It's a question of intent. The extreme right is in cahoots and will always be in cahoots with monopoly capital. And they will utilize the pain that Susan mentioned before in order to mobilize the petty bourgeoisie and various other forces in an alliance with monopoly capital in order to defeat the interests of, pe of the people and the interests of democracy. Whereas the left has exactly the opposite intent. Whether we succeed or not is another matter. And let me finish off with one quotation just to stress how important it is to keep our antennae up and to remain vigilant about narratives. One of the narratives, since we're talking about the myth and the utopia of the European Union, on which this myth is based, is the narrative of the post-war collective will of the European peoples to unite so as never to allow fascism to return. War and fascism. That will was definitely there, and it was a very noble will. But the notion that the European Union, even a monetary union, is on the side of the angels, whereas on the other side we have nationalists that only want national socialism, is completely and utterly wrong. And this is my quotation. And then I'll ask you to tell me who you think wrote this. In my view, a nation's conception of its own freedom must be harmonized with present-day facts and simple questions of efficiency and purpose. Our only requirement of European states is that they are sincere and enthusiastic members of a united Europe. The people of Europe understand increasingly that the great issues dividing us when compared with those which will emerge and will be resolved between continents are nothing but trivial family feuds 
In 50 years, Europeans will not be thinking in terms of separate countries. Any ideas? Goebbels. Franco, revolutionary potential of depression. <clears throat> well, I, be, I, will be, I will be short. But <clears throat> first of all, I want, I want to say something uh, to my young friend. I hate to go around depressing people. I hate to go around saying, oh, it's over how bad the world is and how weak uh, we are. So, but I also hate to go around saying something which is fake, false in my, in my ear. So I try to look at things uh, frankly, and, uh, and I must say um, that uh, we have been unable, we, I say we, and I refer to the movement in Europe. I don't say the left. I don't care about the left. I care about the movement. Because movement is not uh, only a political identification. Movement is the ability of people, of workers, of precarious people, of students, of teachers, to think together. This is a movement. The ability to think and to feel together. We have been totally unable to think, to feel, and to act together face the massacre of the Greek people. We have been a, a totally unable to say something together uh, against the, the humiliation, the, 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 the violence that the financial class has used. We have been unable to organize a, a general strike in Europe. Worst, we have been able to organize a strike of the workers of Southern Europe, which is worse than no strike at all. And you know what is more frightening for me in this moment? The anti-German hatred. The fact that in Athens, in Rome, people are burning German flags. This is frightening. This is the symptom of, of, the, of the final crisis of the European identity, but also of the ability of the movement to be what it has to be, the creation of a new Europe. We have been unable, so far, we have been unable to do that. And you tell me, and so what? And I answer the other question. What about depression? I never say that I never read that depression has a potential, a revolutionary potential. But um, maybe someone said that, but it's not exactly my point. My point is taken by James Hillman, who once upon a time decided to go to Texas. And a friend asked him, why do you go in that horrible, depressing place? And he answered, because depression is the closest place to truth to the understanding, the truth. This is depression. Depression is the, the, the place which is more mm, closed to death, malady, uh, aging, uh, uh, mm, exploitation, violence. Is being there and being able to stare, to look at the eyes. Of the, of the beast. So I say that we should not uh, dismiss, we should not uh, uh, overcome uh, with a pill the lecture, the meaning uh, that is inside depression. We should start from depression. We should start from the understanding that we are very weak, very frail, and uh, also, in a sense, uh, unable to touch each other, to, to, to feel the body of the other. We should start from this understanding. This is the movement that we need, a movement of empathy, a movement of recomposition of a common soul. And this can start uh, from understanding depression. 
Unfortunately, because of the, the award ceremony, and um, we will have to stop now without doing what we promised to do, to offer and to elaborate some solution. Unfortunately, we cannot open the floor now for more questions. Uh, I just want to say one thing. The award ceremony will start very practical at nine, at nine sharp. So please, all of you who have ticket for uh, the next session, please be here at nine. We have a award ceremony and the next round table will start. I think we opened a huge number of questions. There were some pessimistic notes, but there was also some you hinted towards possible scenarios. And this is a great opening of, of our forum. Uh, your words will resonate for sure. So please join me in congratulating our speakers. <laughs>